so many people on this channel and in my membership community who are working to heal from the effects of abuse and neglect in childhood are struggling right now because they've lost their normal level of mental focus and they've lost their normal level of physical energy. And this video is one of a series I'm making where I'm talking about energy, focus, and staying neurologically and emotionally regulated. And today I wanna to talk about the powerful role that food plays in either exhausting you and scattering your thinking or energizing you and keeping your mind alert and focused. Now, it is so important for any kind of healing work you're doing in your life, whether it's around your trauma or any other part of your life, it's important that you know how to get out of brain fog. Now, during the pandemic, we've talked about energy and focus a lot, fatigue and fuzzy thinking. They're not only common symptoms that show up in adults who had childhood trauma. These symptoms are also known side effects of COVID and long COVID. And a lot of people felt it after that, their vaccines for that matter. And I think many, many people are feeling this tired, unable to focus feeling right now as a consequence of all the isolation and stress and upheaval that have been just kind of running our lives for the last couple of years. Now, a lot of people, myself included, gained weight during the pandemic. And as a person with complex trauma, food and weight have always been like some level of challenge for me. But among my thousands of students, I've learned that a majority feel that they've also struggled with food and weight in their lives. And this doesn't properly get talked about, not just as an appearance thing, not just as a health thing, but specifically as a trauma-related symptom. So I wanna talk about that. I wanna talk about a way of eating that I follow, and I'm gonna teach you a little bit about how it works and how you can learn more about it if it interests you. But most importantly, I wanna talk about how eating in this way has had a powerful effect on my ability to heal dysregulation from my own PTSD and to stay regulated and feeling calm and happy almost all the time. So if you watch my videos, you've probably heard me talk a lot about dysregulation. And that's the numb, discombobulated, or sometimes overreactive state that powers so many other symptoms that follow childhood trauma. And an aspect of dysregulation is an out of whack energy level where either you're amped up and anxious and you can't sleep, or you're burned out, sleepy, feeling like you can't move or focus. And going back and forth between these two states or maybe getting stuck more of the time in one of them or the other, it's an almost universal feature for people who grew up with abuse and neglect. That feeling of fuzzy headedness where you can't totally hold a thought or focus, or maybe your memory isn't working properly, or you're just kind of feeling tired and out of it. You feel almost as if there's a membrane between you and the world. And that is a PTSD thing. And yes, it's influenced by what you eat, which I'll talk about in a minute. Now, it may not seem like it, but that tired, unfocused feeling is really one of the worst symptoms of complex trauma. If you have it, you know how miserable it is. It's like a prison. It feels like a hangover that just goes on and on and on. And it makes it so hard to move forward with your life or learn new skills for a job or to be present with a friend or a child who needs you. So the term brain fog sounds sort of cuddly and cute and minor, but really brain fog is a suppression of your being on every level. It's cognitive in your thinking, it's physical, it's emotional, it's spiritual, and it's a kind of deadness. And when it's happening, it's not just that you don't get ahead in life, but you're not even really living your life. And that's the worst feeling. When you feel like your days are just slipping by and you didn't get to be in them. It's just passing you by. And so I'm thinking about brain fog today because once again, I've taken the steps I need to have less of it than I ever have. And I'm taping this video right after recovering from COVID, which has definitely left me with depressed energy levels. And it's, it's weird. I just noticed that when I'm like trying to type an email, I just start saying things that don't really fit with the subject. So there's definitely like something going on there and it's getting better every day. I'm working on it. I'm usually a very focused person. And along with that, my energy has been down because I've been carrying extra weight. And that's a risk for COVID too. 
and luckily I came through just fine. It was pretty quick, not too bad. But it was one more reason that right now I'm coming back to a way of eating that I love and that totally increases my energy level and my focus and that's allowed me in the past to slim down to a right size body, keep the weight off for a long time. And as long as I followed the simple rules of this way of eating, it worked great. <laughs> Obviously, if I gain the weight back, something happened there. So I'll talk about that. But I'm going to teach you about it. And don't worry, I've put a link down below in the description section of this video and all my videos. So if you want to check it out today um, or when the video is done, go down to the link that says, here's the food program I use to heal overeating. Okay. Now, first, I know not everyone watching has a problem with overeating. So no worries if this doesn't apply to you. You might not need the weight part of this, but you might be interested in this way of eating just for the positive effect on clear thinking and energy levels. So there's a way that you adjust it to maintain your weight if that's what you want. So stay with me here. I also know that some of you struggle with eating disorders of various kinds. Now, in no way am I trying to influence you away from the approach to eating that works for you and that keeps you well. And that goes for everyone. I'm about to tell you what works for me and you can learn and try it if that interests you. So no pressure, okay? So I just returned to the way of eating because I want to lose weight. I want to recover my energy and focus and I want to get re-regulated and stay regulated neurologically and emotionally as best I can. That's what really helps me recover from PTSD. So I want to be regulated basically as many hours of the day as I can and for as many days as possible. And the more time that I spend regulated, the better my life goes. That's the general pattern. So some of you have learned about dysregulation from my other videos or my courses. If you want some background on that, you can click the link below. There's a, a dysregulation quiz to find out if you're dysregulated. But food is a factor. It's not the only reason people get brain fog, but I think for most people with CPTSD, it's a major reason. And it's an area where you have some direct control, whereas some of the other causes of dysregulation might be deeper. They have to do with old wounds and patterns and take you know, more of a relearning to start correcting that cause of dysregulation, a trigger. Food is not easy to change either, but at least it's direct. You actually do have control over it. And I would say with the exception of somebody who's deeply addicted and at this time, is really powerless over it. So I acknowledge that. But for the most part, you have a lot of influence over what you eat, right? The other thing is some changes that you make are going to be gradual. What you eat can make a change like right away in how you feel and how well your mind is working for you. And thanks to trauma research, we know a little bit more about why a history of trauma is so closely correlated to food and appetite and craving and weight and metabolism as well as uh, illnesses that go along with those things, diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, cancer. Those are all conditions related to food and weight. And for reasons I explain in other videos and uh, that you can learn a little more deeply about also in the link to the food program I'm sharing with you, those of us who had childhood trauma have a much higher incidence of these problems than the general population. So trauma is closely correlated with health problems and food and weight often play a role in sort of initiating and generating or making worse those health problems. But here's something else. People who went through abuse and neglect as kids have a relatively high incidence of sensitivity to certain foods, namely sugary, flour, high fast carbohydrate foods. Now for a lot of us, we have what you might call a special relationship with that kind of food, bread, pastries, you know, crackers, ice cream, candy, chocolate. And while some people can see a plate of cookies on the table and just like forget about it, those of us with a high sensitivity to them get, you know, very focused on the cookies. I don't know about you, but when I eat a cookie, I'm gonna be very distracted if there are more cookies on the plate. And if nobody's touching them, I'll, I'll start to really think about that. Like, are they gonna eat the cookies? Can I eat the cookies? How many are left? Would anybody care if I ate them? Could I get away with eating all of them? <laughs> so when I eat foods with flour and sugar, it sets off more hunger and craving. And I learned early on when I was a kid that most people don't have that. They don't. So four or five years ago, somebody introduced me to a program called Bright Line Eating. That's the program I follow. And it totally changed my life, really. Not just my relationship to my food, but it changed my life. And I've, again, the link is down below in the description section. 
if you want to check it out. Because if you relate to what I'm saying about food craving, sugar and flour foods, I think you might want to take, there's a quiz there on the website that I link to. It's called the Food Susceptibility Quiz. And you can score yourself on a, on a scale of 1 to 10 of how susceptible you are, you know, how, how bad is the cookie problem, and um, what's your history been with that. And some people are going to have a low score, like 1, 2, 3, 4. Some people are going to have a high score. I think I'm like an 8 or 9 there. So I'm just really susceptible. And that means that so long as I'm eating those foods, I'm really vulnerable to overeating on them. And there was something really interesting that came out um, last year, and I learned this from Susan Pierce Thompson, who created Bright Line Eating. There's, there's this idea that goes around that if you're middle-aged like me, I'm in my 50s, that it's a lot harder to lose weight. And that was my experience, but it turns out for people who aren't eating all that sugar and flour and who are eating healthy foods that are balanced and but just don't have those high fast carbohydrates that spike your insulin level up, people who are at any age lose weight at about the same rate. I mean, this is incredible news. This was this used to be like gospel. Oh yeah, the older you get, you know, it's so hard to lose weight. It's hard to lose weight if you're eating flour and sugar. And that's hard at any age, but it, that the problem of that really gets a lot worse as we age. So that is actually fabulous news, but it just brings more and more of my commitment to this to go, oh gosh, you know, I need to change. This is the way I need to eat because it's so, I got so many good things going for me in life. I'm working on a book. I'm about to do a bunch of live appearances. I lead these coaching calls and a coaching program that I'm about to bring out. And I do a lot of work and everything good in my life depends on how much I have focus and energy. And if I'm going through tired and dragging myself through, that, that will directly influence how many people I can reach with the message I'm trying to bring about how you can self-heal a lot of your trauma symptoms. So I consider this like really important. It's, it's I, of course, I'd love to look, you know, skinny and cute like a model. <laughs> and, and, and I will, I will expect some progress in that area, but, but the really big change that I that anybody at any age can have is to kind of bring yourself back from that fog that you may have been living in if you're like me. So Susan Pierce Thompson, who started this program, she had been an alcoholic and a drug addict in her youth, and she got clean at the age of 20, I think, and then she went on to gain over 100 pounds. And after she had gained the weight, she went on and got a PhD in neuroscience, and what she set out to research was why are some of us so sensitive to carbohydrates, to flour and sugar in particular? And one of the first things she did is create that susceptibility quiz. And w what she put together, and this, this was so important to my understanding of trauma, she didn't go that deep into trauma initially, and I hope she will. I hope I get to work with her one day on this. That in studies of rats, most rats are born with a normal metabolism of how they handle these two hormones. It's, it's insulin and leptin. Insulin is the hormone that comes up when you eat carby food and it's natural and it's normal and it helps you metabolize it. And leptin is the hormone that comes up in response to insulin and says, okay, great, you just had a big stomach full of pasta so you can stop now and you feel satiated. Well, what happens is, what's happening in a person whose susceptibility score is up in the high numbers is, generally, that insulin, for whatever reason, either because you're born like that or because uh, there's been some like overuse of insulin through binging on sugar or, or get this, because trauma has happened, because remember trauma can dysregulate the endocrine system. The endocrine system is your hormones. Insulin is a hormone. So, you know, this is, this is huge that you, you may have been told if you carry extra pounds, like, oh, you're trying to avoid intimacy. And I want you to ask yourself if that's true. That is an assumption about people who have extra weight on them that they're trying to avoid intimacy. But what if they actually had trauma and trauma disrupted their endocrine system and that's what it is. So there's something that happens when we eat those foods that triggers insatiable hunger and insatiable craving to have more. And it creates this irrational desire to keep eating even when you're full or a lack of perception that you are full. Okay, so back to the rats. Some rats have that characteristic and they will just eat and eat and eat. If you fill up their bowl and leave it there, they'll eat until they die. And so some rats are born like that. And the ones who are born like that tend to have offspring who have that. That's, you know, not all, but many. That's, it's a genetic thing. 
But also, normal rats, if they go through trauma, and I don't even want to think about how they traumatized rats, but we went through trauma. And if you're like me, you'll instinctively recognize the experience of going through trauma, especially chronic trauma, can cause you to flip from somebody who has a normal hormonal balance of insulin and leptin and flip to somebody who has a disrupted balance of them and it goes into insatiable hunger and craving. Now, a lot of people talk about emotional eating and I think that's a thing, but I don't think it's the only thing. That's my experience. I think eating can be a way to calm down stress. It can be a way to kind of fog out. You know, in my dysregulation boot camp, I asked this question that some people find challenging, which is, when you get all dysregulated and discombobulated and spaced out and out of it, are there any upsides to that? Because almost everybody can focus on the downsides. It's like, I can't function, I can't think, I tend to get overreactive, I'm, checked, I, I, I'm not connected to people, I'm failing on the job. You know, there's so many bad things that happen because of dysregulation from CPTSD. But what are the upsides? And for myself, I could say the upside of dysregulation and the way that, the way that I maybe was reluctant to, to really, really do everything I could to get rid of it is, it's a little bit of a way to escape. You know, when we all, like the, the four trauma reactions are fight, flight, freeze, and fawn. Fawning is when you're like, oh, please like me. Freeze is when you just don't know what to say. And fighting is when you get, you know, argumentative and flight can be all these forms of escape. You literally run away, you go play video games, you smoke pot, or for example, you go eat a bunch of sugar and just kind of check out that way. Now that one, I, that, I, I get that, <laughs> I get that. I think it's not the same for everybody and in one person it's not always the same reason. But there's a little bit of a payoff to overeating on carby food if you have CPTSD. I think it feels at first kind of grounding. You know, sometimes if you're really dysregulated and you can't really get yourself back, eating a sandwich or something, it helps you sort of come back and feel a little more present. You nourish yourself. You have a little bit more to work with. But there's this temptation to overdo it. And that's where the oblivion comes in. So yes, oblivion is one way out of dysregulation when you're just like, uh, that's not quite the same as, you know, feeling um, panicky or manic or hypervigilant. You know, it feels a little more comforting at first maybe, but in the long run, it's very, very dysregulating. And that's the thing. It's like all drugs really. You know, alcohol, people can be drawn to alcohol because they're sad and it helps them sort of escape their feelings for a little while, but in the long run, it leads to a lot more sadness. So that's a little bit about it. But the point I wanna make is that trauma can cause somebody with normal function around food to flip over into somebody who has a disrupted uh, hormonal relationship to food. So maybe you were fine in earlier years and lately you find yourself overeating. I think a lot of people have got that during the pandemic. And I mean, generally we've all noticed that whatever our worst characteristics are, they had a little more room to run around in the pandemic, right? <laughs> and one of them was overeating. A lot of people gained weight, people joked about it, but for some of us, it's not really a joke. It's, it's, a, it's a risk factor for not just for COVID, but cancer and a lot of other problems, asthma. So, so it's important, it feels good. And I, I, I wanna say this really um, compassionately towards people like, I know like a lot of people watching because you're traumatized, a lot of people have extra weight and it might be triggering even to talk about it or you're not ready to look at it, which is fine. You may never do anything about it, which is totally fine. Everybody gets to do what they want. I remember when I've talked about my food program, program before to this community, some of the people who had bulimia or anorexia got very upset and just felt like, look, stop giving out food advice. So again, I wanna reiterate, this is not universal food advice. This is me telling you what I do in case it benefits you. I know that in the Bright Line Eating community, they call it, you know, there's four bright lines and it's flour, sugar, bounded quantities. So you don't eat just unlimited amounts of things. It's all measured. And then meal times without snacking in between. Those are the four bright lines. Some people use what they call a fifth bright line, which has to do with either deprivation or binging. So that is acknowledged in the program. The other thing I wanna say about the program is it's very flexible about what you eat. It, um, you choose from, you know, for breakfast, you would have um, a grain of fruit and a protein. And depending on your gender and size, you, you might scale your portions a little bit, but you 
plan it in advance, and you have from these groups these simple blocks of food. Now, if you're a vegan, your protein can be made of soy. If you're uh, into meat, you can have any kind of protein you want. You can have meat, beans, seeds, um, you know, anything that's out there. there. There's a standard measurement that you can use for that. And then we eat fruits and vegetables and um, some fat every day. And so it's very, very flexible what those things are. And the website has a deep Q&A about like, what if I'm paleo? What if I'm keto? You know, maybe eating programs that don't involve fruit. So what do you do with that? You can go have a look at that if that interests you. So I had this glorious five months using Brightline Eating um, four or five years ago. And it, it was during that time that I started the crappy childhood fairy work in earnest because suddenly all this consciousness and energy was with me. And I had thought before I was introduced to this concept and what Susan Pierce Thompson teaches, I had thought that I was lazy, I'm a bad dieter, I just lack self-discipline, and I found out, and this is very parallel to, what, to learning about dysregulation and PTSD, I found out I have a really normal reaction to having a couple of hormones out of whack, probably because of trauma. I don't know, maybe it's genetic. It doesn't really matter. What matters is that I heal it. And this way of eating is a way that you can heal that imbalance. And I'll just tell you right now, there's no permanent healing of it. It's a way of eating that you continue to do. You get to add a lot of food when you are happy with your weight, but you know, in terms of portions, but going back to flour and sugar is never in the plan. Okay, now that said, I've totally gone back to flour and sugar many times, and I got my experience with that. It you know, causes weight to come back. It causes me to kind of lose that mental clarity that I had. One of the first things I noticed, I have a lot of friends who do bright line eating, including many people in the Crappy Childhood Fairy membership. One of the first things that a lot of us notice that we start doing when you've got like two, three, four weeks when you've been eating this way and that clarity starts to show up is you get this desire to like clean out closets and drawers. And that right there, like that right there, I feel like is a good reason to do it. If anything would get you to do it. Um, I'm in the middle of learning a book um, that I'll talk about in a subsequent video about the relationship of clutter and trauma. Like we got a lot of issues here with trauma. And so anything that helps to empower us to take action that make life nicer for us, I'm just so for it. All right, here's the downside. It can be really hard to get through the first couple of weeks of this plan. Some people feel like their energy is down for even a few months. For me, I've noticed, I don't know, it's somewhere between five and 10 days because I've gone off it several times and come back. And so that transition back onto it, you're kind of changing what you're using for energy. So there is this kind of like cost to your energy level at first. And it's a sleepiness. I think some people like who eat keto, they call it keto flu. I think flu is too strong a word for what I've experienced, but yeah, there's a cost to the energy. And so a good time to start is when you just are okay to deal with that, or maybe you were already trying to heal something in your life. Like for me, getting over COVID, which I knew I would be tired anyway, I'm like, all right, let's just be tired. Let's just go ahead and deal with this and then you know, build a beautiful ramp for me to come back nice and strong. And there's this quick payoff is that as soon as you're doing it, the extra water retention that's been going on begins to fall away. So you get this little quick weight loss often. And as a way of losing weight, I've just found it to be efficient and um, healthy and sustainable. And there's a lot of research done by Susan Pierce Thompson. I encourage you to go take a look at it. It's coming out that this way of eating is, if not the best, maybe it's the best, it's among the very best long-term weight loss solutions. Cause that's what happens. You know, she's the first to point out. So many people try to lose weight every year and I think 1% of them are gonna keep it off. It's so tiny. You probably have had the experience. Like it's so likely, even if you can get the weight off, that you can keep it off. And I'm still not one of those people. Like I'm right now carrying the extra weight that I gained back, but I'm trying to be one of the long-term successes. I wanna live a long time. I wanna live vibrantly. I wanna have one size of clothes and have like a few nice things and not like all these different sizes I have to pull out for different weights. That's been going on a long time. So I'm into this. I wanna support you in doing it. I wanna be accountable to you while I do it. And I would really like to bring in Brightline Eating as a component recommended for anybody 
who in my community of learners who feels like it might be a fit for them. N not a requirement, None of no nothing I teach is required at all. But I teach a couple things. I teach the daily practice. I have courses about changing your life. But the daily practice techniques I teach, the getting free of the fearful and resentful thoughts and then resting in meditation. I gotta say, a bunch of us have been using this together with Bright Line Eating, people in the uh, membership community. We've been, we've been talking every day for like months on this. We're, we're kind of a little group. And we feel it goes together so powerfully because getting re-regulated through the daily practice makes us a little more capable of sticking to the plan. And eating this way supports our re-regulation. So they kind of ping pong off of each other to get you a better result than either one by themselves will just in terms of calming dysregulation and the sort of, um, you know, CPTSD symptoms that make you kind of lose your focus and get all off track, get very emotional, get uh, triggered by things. All of that can come way down. I also noticed it really improved mood and a lot of people report that there's just a sort of baseline happiness, the, the floor of your happiness, it comes up a little higher just generally. So you might find you get that result. So that's why I, I'm reintroducing Bright Line Eating and recommending it to people here. I have a partnership agreement with the organization. So I have a special link. If you use the link and access stuff down there, there's a little bit of a percentage of what you pay them for whatever you decide to buy that would that goes to me and then it helps crappy childhood fairy and helps us pay our staff and do what we do so it's pretty wonderful all around but here's the other downside of bright line eating i don't know about you i just want to eat whatever i want <laughs> i do i i don't like having to restrict what i eat and that's just a big problem for for a lot of people i'm not the only one i will i just want to i want to travel to italy and eat whatever they're eating <laughs> And what I've learned is, you know what? On any time I want, I can eat whatever I want. Um, but there's, it makes it harder, it makes it harder to come back. Every time I sort of go off plan, I kind of lose the focus, but I can. It's a one day at a time program. So I wouldn't worry too much about tomorrow or forever. I would just say, try this for a day, see how the first day feels. Um, I think it's recommended you try it for 14 days to see how it feels for you and what it does for you. And again, if it doesn't feel right to you, just ignore this. <laughs> Let it be a reflection on how people eat and how people work with food. And I know a lot of people use nutrition, you know, and are much more specific about what to eat. And there's probably going to be comments about that, about like, you know, you should eat this kind of protein, not that kind of protein or these supplements. And that's all fine. That's all fine. What I love about bright line eating is everybody gets to kind of bring to it what they believe is important. Um, and they get to ignore what they don't think is important. So there's a lot of flexibility there. I want to stay with it because what I remember so painfully about the feeling of gaining that weight back in the last few years was it brought back the same old feeling of be feeling regret. I'd wake up in the middle of the night feeling like sorry and like why, why am I holding myself back like this? And the same old feeling of being drained in the afternoon, like feeling in the afternoon like I got to get a nap and then being foggy in my thinking right at the time when I have to do stuff. Another thing in this program that's acknowledged is that many of us sort of fall off the wagon sometimes. And so there's this word in the program called resume. Um, and it sounds like resume, like get back to it. It's spelled R-E-Z-O-O-M. And there's even a course called Reboot Resume. The um, leader of this program, Susan Pierce Thompson, has actually done a lot of research on the psychology and neurobiology of people when they have kind of like given up on the way they're eating and addictively feel like sucked in back into the vortex, how they come back out again. And so there's a lot of support for that. There's a big social support component. So it's videos and there are books that you can buy. You don't have to buy everything, but um, the basic thing that they teach, the thing that I took that was really like the main thing that got me started in this, it's called the boot camp. Recently, they changed their pricing structure. Prices came way down from where they were, which makes it so much more accessible. And the organization has a goal to you know, transform these high levels of obesity that are happening all over the world and all the health problems that go with that. And to do that, it, has to, it had to be more, less expensive. I'll let you look up the price because I want this video to, be, to last a long time and prices may change over time, but go look up the price in the link and, and see if you think you can afford it. There's even a monthly fee. It's very, very affordable. So 
I just started again. I invite any of you who feel called to this to give it a try. So if you've decided to start it uh, and you're liking it, write to me. I want to hear about it. And who knows, there may be a community to form with you of people who have CPTSD and are using my techniques along with Bright Line Eating. So one thing I notice as I do this, not only does weight come off, but my spirits come up. So even if I knew that no matter how much I use this food plan, I would just never, like my weight would not ever go down. I would still do this because of the way it makes me feel. It feels that good. I've got so much I want to do in my life and I know you have so much you want to do in your life. And the tragedy of CPTSD is how through all these means of our health, our thinking, our energy levels, our loss of confidence, our triggers, we get suppressed and oppressed and unable to fulfill the potential that we have here. So this is how healing happens. We start to work on the thing that's right in front of us. It can feel overwhelming sometimes. It's like, you know, there's 10 different things I'm supposed to be trying. <laughs> You're talking here. Pick the one that calls to you. Pick the one that sounds delicious to you right now. For me right now, the food program is front and center of my own healing. And then I continue in my daily practice. So you get to call that shot for yourself and do the thing that's right in front of you. I always say like, there's this wheel spinning, it's your PTSD, just stop that wheel spinning with anything that you've got at your disposal. And you're like, oh, well, I could change my eating today. Boom, put that stick in the wheel, break the wheel, break that wheel of PTSD, stop the symptoms right now, do what you can do. And when you get good at that, you can start bringing in other elements. It's totally, not only workable to do it that way, it's recommended that you do things like that, you know, a little at a time. You try to do everything at once and you're like, oh, screw it. And you go right back to all the self-destructive, self-defeating behaviors. So just a little at a time, support yourself, stay connected with people. If you can come into our community, we have lots of people on the healing path to walk it with you. So I rarely endorse anything, but this is one of the handful of things along with the writing and meditation techniques I teach that has genuinely moved my healing forward. You'll find a link down below if you want to check it out. If you want to learn more about brain fog, focus, and energy, I've got a video lined up for you right here, and I will see you very soon. <laughs>